I want to welcome each and every one of you this morning. You know, sometimes we feel that we should just rush in and get the service finished and then you go out and we don't see each other. But if you have something to share with us, please come, share with us. We are a family. Amen. We are a family. Loretta is not here this morning. I'm so sad that she's not here. It's her birthday. <laughs> but uh, she once said many years ago that uh, we, I always said that we are a family. And you know that morning, they were, it's a Christmas morning and there were people that morning from Australia and from uh, America and Canada. They, they were visiting us. They, uh, the people who brought them here has got a place on the, uh, on the river and uh, they were here celebrating Christmas. And afterwards they came to me, they said to me, you know, that uh, to hear that you are a family, that is for me so much. It means so much. And yes, we are a family. That's what, when we share with one another, you know, we can share as a family. Not as strangers to one another, but as a family to one another. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, before we go into further, uh, I, I wonder if I must do it maybe later on. Uh, uh, maybe if there's more people before I start preaching, then we welcome each other. Okay. I'll, I'll just put that a little bit uh, on the ice <laughs> and we come back. But uh, let us pray. Our wonderful Lord. I'm so excited this morning. I know that you are with me. You are with each and every one of us here together. And we can say thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you that we can prepare for the time that's coming, Good Friday, the day when you gave up your life for our sins, that you died for us on the cross, that you paid for us all, no one excluded, it's just for us to come to you. We thank you for all the many blessings that you bestowed on us during this week. The lovely rains that we had on Sunday night. For many years, I've never been so soaking wet than on Sunday night here at the chapel. But I can rejoice to know that you gave us that rain. You blessed us, Lord. And during this week, you gave us so many blessings. And we can only say thank you. We praise you, Lord. We want to glorify your name in all things we are doing and wherever we go. Let us never forget your name, Jesus. Never forget what you have done for us. Thank you, Jesus. I'll follow God in heaven and Lord be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Keep us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive us the trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. Descended of Jacob, honor him, revere him, all your descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or detained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has list, listened to his cry for help. From you came, from you come. You comes my place in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, will I fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and certified. Then they, sorry, the poor will eat and be certified. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and the rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive Authority will save him. Future generation will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his preciousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. Amen. Isn't it wonderful? A promise that goes out so far, so that we don't always remember if we go to, to verse number uh, verse 1 when David say my God, my God why have you forsaken me and then we will think about back what Jesus said on the cross this was a thousand years before Jesus also said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That words we need to remember because we are protected by our wonderful God. I think 
we sing our next song. And then while we're singing, I don't know. Uh, I think, okay, let's come together. And we wish each other a wonderful morning with Jesus here at this place. If they will bring a song to us. Sing a bahamba yoti na kulom shaba siye kaya Then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Out of my sight, Satan, he said. 
We do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes in his father's name with the Holy this is the word of God. Thank you. The so, uh, next song is not, uh, number 22 in the phrase and worship. <clears throat> Come on and celebrate this gift of love we will celebrate. The Son of God who loves us and gave us love. We'll shout your praise, O King. You give us joy nothing else can bring. We'll give you our offering in celebration praise. Come on and celebrate, celebrate, celebrate and sing. Celebrate and sing to the King. Come on and celebrate, celebrate, celebrate and sing. Celebrate and sing to the King. Come on and celebrate. His gift of love we will celebrate. This Son of God who loved us. Give us love, we will shout your praise for me. You give us joy, nothing else can bring. We'll give to you our offering in celebration and praise. Come on and celebrate, celebrate, celebrate and sing, celebrate and sing to the King. Let us pray. The Lord, we, we thank you for this opportunity that we can come before you, that we can listen to your word that you gave us. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and our minds that we will listen to your word now. And that we glorify your name. Bring your word. We praise your word.
Romans 4, verse 13 to 25. It was not through the law that Abram and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For I, for if those who live by law are heirs, faith has no value, and the promise is worthless, because law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by law, by faith, so that if it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom we believe. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abram in hope believed that and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be, without weakening in, the, in his faith. He faced the fact that the body was as good as dead. Since he was about to a hundred years old, and that Sarah, Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written, were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in Him, who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was delivered over the dead to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. For our justification. We today are celebrating the second Sunday of Lent. The question today is what makes us an heir of God? How does life and faith of Abraham inform our faith and work. This season of Lent, a season of repentance in which we take stock of our spiritual standing before God. Time 
we reflect upon the character of God as well as our own. And this season prepares us for Holy Week. In which the Lord Jesus came to Jerusalem to declare judgment upon Jerusalem for its rejection of Jesus and her many sins. There will be a judgment day. At the same time, we remember that Jesus come to do something about it. It was He who would bear our sin upon the cross, that we, we might be safe and have eternal life. And then my friends comes the resurrection of Jesus from the dead which is our hope for resurrection and eternal life. God told Abram that he would be a blessed, he would be blessed and become the father of many people and nations. This is reflected in the chance, the change of his name from Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah. And this also formed the foundation to Paul's argument as we shall see. When we read in Psalm 22, when the psalmist say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This psalm predicts a thousand years in advance the crucifixion of Jesus, who is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. would ultimately be through Jesus that the promise of Abram would come to many many people and nations it is interesting to note the portion of song of the song does not mention the crucifixion but it mentioned the resurrection. In Mark, Jesus had just heard Peter's confession of Jesus when he said that Jesus is the Messiah. But Jesus told him that his source for this confession from the Holy Spirit. Then Jesus turned and he told the disciples about his upcoming rejection and death in Jerusalem. And Peter, as we know, was Peter. He just said the words that Jesus might, that Jesus said uh, that Jesus is the Messiah. He just recognized and gave all people the, the word that Jesus is the Messiah. And now that Jesus said that he will, he will have to die, he can't accept it. He rebukes Jesus, saying that this could not happen 
through the Messiah. Are you done? Did he knew Jesus. While Jesus knew what was the truth, what was going to happen. Jesus rebuked Peter with the words, Get behind me, Satan. And these words were made for all his disciples. Never try to know more than Jesus. He also adds a detail that the words he may say, say, is not just made for the twelve, but for the crowd also. The invitation to costly discipleship is to all who will be follow Jesus, including us. To be a disciple. It's not just an easy task on the road to the cross. During this season of need, we reflect that we must need to suffer if we would truly follow Jesus. As we read in Genesis, the number of the blessed through Abraham would be as the sand of the sea. But if we look at verse 14 that we can begin with 4, this word is a development marker for prayer that provides additional information to what they have just been being said by God. In the previous verses, Paul talks about the meaning of circumcision which was the Old Testament sign of a covenant which was to be imposed upon Abram and his children and even his servants. This was commanded unto all generations. This would present an issue to those who were not the physical descendants of Abraham. But we ask the questions were they exclu excluded from the inheritance? And were those who were Abraham's physical descendants and who were circumcised automatically included? We can see the circumcision of Iron's servants that even though they were not physical descendants, they could participate to some degree in the covenant, but only as slaves. Very interesting. It would seem that these proselytes might rise to the level of the dividends, but not the sunshine. They could draw water for the sons as well as you need. But they would be perpetual and the cross.
This presents its own problem. One which all had to deal with in the nations. Paul placed great emphasis in this his teaching of the order of the blessing and the imposition of circumcision. But first of all, it must be noted that Abram was not a Jew. Paul does not elaborate, elaborate but simply states that Abram received the blessing before he was circumcised. He put other words as a Gentile. We know that God spoke to Abram that he must leave his family and his bed uh, in the earth and he must come back down to Canaan. We should add that Father Abram had many sons. There was Ishmael who was circumcised. He was a physical descendant from Abram. But as Father Abram, as father of the Arabian, Arabian nations, he would not be blessed extended. His blessing would not extend to Ishmael's descendants as much as to Isaac. And it's thought looking very confusion. But the Islamic men are indeed circumcised when they turn 30, remembering that Ishmael was circumcised at this age. And then remember that Abram later had now six sons. After not their descendant included also. Are their descendants included also? But Isaac also was not a Jew. He was the promised son of Abraham. He had two sons, Esau and Jacob, who later became Ishmael. What about Esau's descendants? They were descendants of Abram, but also they were not Jews. The children of Israel would probably be called Israelites, but not all of them were Jews. Only the sons of Jacob's son Judah would probably be called a Jew. So even if we look at the promises of the covenant of circumcision, being limited to physical descendants and their slaves who were circumcised, we come to a question. And we want to know in this question who in what inherits what. The land of Canaan, which is today called Palestine, was given to Abram before he was circumcised. This blessing has become a curse of souls as physical behaviors of Abram continue to fight over the rights of that land. As we had it at the moment, instead of sharing God's blessing, they wish to apply the promise given to Abram only to their own particular good. There is simply not room for all of them. But 
and friends. This infers of course that God has a much greater inheritance in mind than a small piece of land called Palestine by some and Israel by others. But you know, as we have noted, Paul had a much deeper vision into the greater promise, one that included all people, Jew and Gentile, regardless of their genealogy. Jews and Gentiles are on equal footing in Christ. That's very really interesting. But we want to be more important than others. We don't want to accept that we can be equal before Christ. We want to have our hierarchy set by ourselves and not by Christ. Through the covenant of baptism, women could be included as well as men. As Paul notes from Genesis, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Listen to the obedience. Obedience that we listen to the words, the voice. We also read the poem, talk about the promises we have spoken to Abram and his seed. He does not say, and seeds, only mention, and your seed. Is Christ. And we come and we listen, we noted before the promise to Abram was not ultimately fulfilled in Isaac or any other of Abram's physical descendants. But one seed, a special seed. Isaac serves as a type of Christ. But he was not Christ. But Christ would come from the descendants, first through Jacob, then to Judah, then eventually to the descendants of David, and then to Christ Jesus. Christian confesses that this Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. And this announcement that we can all live on the true is The true name of Christ's speech. They are Christ's speech. This is not to say that Abraham's physical descendants are blessed in some way, but it is as the blessed blessing Isaac gave to Esau and not to Jacob. The Christian should not strive for land in earthly Jerusalem. There is enough conflict already. But the Christian confesses that he is a stranger and a pilgrim on the earth. Abraham was invited to look upon the land of Canaan 
as an earthly inheritance for his descendants. The good news is that Abram has found a far greater inheritance than earthly pain. We have now covered that the inherit what the inheritance is and who is the giver of our inheritance. We now turn to the question of who is an heir and what makes us an heir. And again we ask the question, do we earn the inheritance? Do we have an earthly birthright to this inheritance? This was a view of many Jews in Paul's days. And these Jews from the day are elected by Yahweh. The mark of circumcision was proved that their right was their inheritance. To this also was their commitment to the law of Moses, which proved their justification. But Paul teaches that there is a difference between external commitment to the Torah and actual keeping. There is a difference. If these Jews were right, then where do those who where were those who were not Jews even they stand? There were some allowance by becoming a proselyte gentle, but there was restrictions. Some had to wait ten generations. Then their descendants might come into a covenant as true Jews. Certain people, like the Moabites, were never were always excluded. There was a class of God's spirits who were the same as the Gibeonites. In the early Christian church, great controversy broke out over whether Christians convert who were, who were Gentiles had to make commitment to circumcision to keep the law of Jesus of Moses. Paul's argument as well as in other places is that we need to see how Abraham was justified before God. Abraham lived before there was a Torah. Abram was a very good man, but even his righteousness fell short of the glory of God. The call of Abram by Yahweh was entirely based upon the grace of God. In Ephesians 2, we read, For by grace we have been saved through faith, and that's not your, yourselves. It is a gift of God. So grace and faith serve as the basis of the covenant. By grace alone, God called call Abraham and made covenantal promises. On these covenantal promise occurs 
the day he was to be the father of many people and nations. Paul rightly reminds us that Abraham and Sarah was in bronze age. It was impossible to be impossible by the means in the day to change that. But Abraham's response is that he did not consider the situation he was in, but rather that the Lord was able to keep the promise. And he believed in, in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. We can see in the Ishmael project that he was not perfect, that he and Sarah felt the need for something else before God takes some time to fulfill this promise. The first covenant is unconditional and universal in scope. The second covenant of circumcision and of circumcision and is unconditional and limited. As Adam, Adam, Adam and Eve were the only ones to live. This is a universal promise to all humanity. This promise, promise seed is Jesus Christ. We see the bruise by the nails on the cross. It is He who gives the death, the death wound to the serpent. There are no limitations we accept here except as we see that we must believe on the one whom God sent. So the promises that God are for all who believe. So we need to reflect, we need to reflect upon. We take time here in Lent to mourn our sins and failure, to believe as we ought. But in doing so, we reflect that the new covenant is based upon God's perfect fullness, faithfulness to the covenant. We look at the cross as well as the resurrection, which is in the we will make it for our justification. We hope not in ourselves but in the promises of God. Our physical bodies age and die, but our hope does not. Romans tells us that this hope will never bring us to shame, but eternal life. We realize that the one who created all things out of nothing can completely transform us into the image as incredible as it must seem at times. My friends, let us continue in the walk of faith. We show, we shall never disappoint. We walk in faith. We will never be disappointed. Amen. Let us sing number seventy one. Thank you. 
trip with the morning, I think I'll be sitting for that. <laughs> Let me stand and sing. I know it's a different song for you, and uh, but I'm sure you, I'm sure you will pick it up. I walk by faith in shape, by faith to live, by faith I put my trust in you. I walk by faith. In shame, by faith, to live, by faith, I put my trust in you. Every step I take is a step of faith. No weapon formed against me will prosper. And every prayer I make is a prayer of faith. And if my God is holy, then who can be against me? I walk by faith, he shed by faith, to live by faith, I put my trust in you. I walk by faith, he shed by faith, to live by faith, I put my trust in you. Every step I take is a step of faith. The weapons fall against me will prosper. And every prayer I make is a prayer of faith. And if my God is for me, then who can be against me? I That reminds us that we must have faith in God. A message that reminds us that we are disciples and that we must disciple each other. A message that reminds us that during this season of Lent, we must be a blessing, not only a blessing to the people that we know, but a blessing to everyone that we meet, to every believer that we fellowship with because it's only through us connecting and through us having faith in him that we are able to reach the level of sonship that God wants us to be. So this was a powerful message, a message 
that wants or that seeks to bring us closer to God, a message that seems to remind us to be able to disciple each other in the word of God. Amen. Um, our announcements are as follows. It's a reminder. different positions in meeting. Give that you are our leader and not people. God be you. We pray for this world. Wherever we they are wars, famine, we can touch it. Try to protect us. Take us now through this week. Thank you. 
And then if the Lord let make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. Amen. Yeah. 